Hello and welcome to this Thursday edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. Today we tell you about the Relief Emergency Assistance and Community Health Reach Program. It's the government's newly announced initiative to manage a targeted and sustainable recovery process. Plus, being your accountability partner to keep your heart in check as you get back to a level of normalcy. And also of importance is the need to get rid of mosquito breeding sites to prevent an outbreak of dengue. The latest news of the day is first, so stay with us. An emergency shelter is provided by the government as a safe alternative and last resort for those negatively affected by disasters. Here are things to consider before going to a shelter. Is it safe to stay at home? If the answer is yes, remain indoors until you receive the all clear from the recognized authorities such as the ODPEM and the Meteorological Service of Jamaica and it is safe to go outside. If your location is not safe and you can temporarily shelter with friends or family who live in a safe location, ask and if yes, relocate. But if you may get hurt at home and there are no friends or family you can securely stay with, then seek refuge at the closest emergency shelter. Remember to take food, water, and other essential supplies for at least three days. During a disaster, we want all Jamaicans to be safe. Have a plan. Keep up to date with the latest information so you can make the best decision for your safety. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry and this is your GIS News for Thursday, July 11, 2024. Government is much closer to implementing a policy announced earlier this year that will provide an income tax credit to individuals who acquire and install solar power at their primary place of residence. The Income Tax Amendment Act 2024 to enact the policy was passed by the House of Representatives on Tuesday. The bill makes provisions for an income tax credit at the rate of 30% of the acquisition and installation cost of the solar photovoltaic system up to a maximum cost of $4 million. This means that the maximum credit an individual will be allowed to claim is $1.2 million. This measure shall apply to solar photovoltaic systems acquired and installed on or after the 1st of January 2023, i.e. for the year of assessment 2023. The value of the income tax credit will be applied to the acquisition and installation price of the solar photo photovoltaic system and will be claimable in the year the system is installed. In order to claim the credit, the taxpayer will have to provide proof such as invoices and independent verification that the solar photovoltaic system is installed and is generating electricity. The Minister of Finance and the Public Service says the measure forms part of a much broader goal of reducing Jamaica's dependence on fossil fuels and substantially increasing the share of renewable energy in our local energy mix. This Honourable House will also recall that in my budget presentation earlier this year, as a part of the 2024-2025 uh, budget, I indicated that the government will also be reducing the corporate income tax rate for independent power producers producing 75% or more of their energy from renewable sources from 33.3% to 25%. The objective of this rate reduction is to promote growth within the renewable energy sector by providing a more favorable tax environment and providing more of an incentive for larger scale investment in renewable energy technologies such as wind and solar. The major components utilized in the installation of a solar photovoltaic system, such as the solar photovoltaic panels, inverters and batteries, are also exempt from the payment of GCT. 
A centralized electronic Know Your Customer EKYC public utility system is being developed to streamline and simplify the process for opening a bank account. It will also make it easier for Jamaicans to switch their account to the bank offering the best services and products. The Bank of Jamaica BOJ is leading the development of the EKYC public utility system with support for research and framework development being provided by the World Bank. In such a system, the custom information that is required for various banking transactions is stored digitally in a database that is kept securely and confidentially by a central trusted authority. When a customer is conducting business with any financial institution, that, that institution can access the customer's information immediately, very that per, verify that that person is exactly who they say they are, and complete their transaction in minutes, not days or not weeks. The Minister of Finance updated Parliament on the system during Tuesday's sitting of the House of Representatives. He says the product, which is expected to promote competition within the banking sector and modernize regulatory oversight, should be realized within the next two years. It is also expected to boost compliance with laws and regulations dealing with anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. The process is expected to involve some necessary legislative changes and interagency collaboration to ensure success, and the BOJ will be consulting widely with the financial sector. Legislation will be brought to Parliament to allow for the prosecution of persons found guilty of the theft of critical telecommunications infrastructure. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has given that charge to the Ministers of National Security and Energy and Telecommunications. He was referencing the theft of fuel, batteries and generators from repeater stations of telecom providers during the passage of Hurricane Beryl. This impacted telephone and internet connection during the hurricane. The telecommunication companies, what they have said is that their systems would have been far more resilient and persons would not have been cut off were it not for the fact that they took the precautionary measures of refueling before the hurricane. And on the day of refueling or shortly thereafter, they are seeing their sensors showing that the fuel is gone. In condemning the act, Mr. Holness says the country cannot allow critical infrastructure to be preyed upon, and so strong measures must be put in place to address the problem. We must call it out because there are communities where the people know who is doing it. It is no different from the goat thief. It is no different from the people who steal the copper wires. They put our economy of the local farmer at risk. They put our telecommunication service, which gives us our security and access at risk. The government has issued a strong warning against price gouging in the aftermath of Hurricane Beryl. In a statement to Parliament on Tuesday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness said an order had been issued under the Trade Act to prevent price gouging on essential goods. We are closely monitoring market activities to ensure that unscrupulous individuals do not exploit this disaster for financial gains. Our citizens should not, should have access to the necessary supplies at fair prices. I ask the public to report any instance of price gouging, meaning, meaning an increase in price over and above what you were paying for the same product or service before the hurricane. Reports of price gouging can be made to the Consumer Affairs Commission or to the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. Jamaica has received a donation of medical equipment and supplies worth over 14,000 US dollars from the United States government. The donation was delivered by the United States naval ship USNNS Burlington as it docked at the Kingston Wharves on Wednesday. The items are part of the U.S. Naval Force Southern Command's continuing Promise 2024. Director of Emergency Disaster Management and Special Services in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Nicole Dawkins-Wright, welcomed the support for Jamaica's post-hurricane recovery efforts. Today's donation, especially those CPAP machines, which comes at the most opportune time post-hurricane burial, testifies to the value of partnerships in public health 
and is a most excellent example of what can come from international cooperation in health. The donation comes on the heels of Tuesday's announcement of 2.5 million U.S. dollars in humanitarian assistance through the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. We are proud to support our Jamaican friends and we want Jamaicans to know we are here not only to offer our assistance but also to help robustly as you try to recover from Hurricane Barrow. And finally, Minister of Local Government and Community Development Desmond McKenzie is reporting that there are still about 10 shelters in operation following the passage of Hurricane Beryl on July 4. He says more than 100 persons are occupying these shelters. A lot of these shelters that are occupying these persons are persons whose home has been damaged severely or has no home at all. And we will be doing a quick assessment as to see how we are going to treat with those cases and what are the arrangements that we will make to provide some temporary uh, residence for them until we can put the necessary things in place to ensure that at least they are comfortable. The minister was speaking at Wednesday's post-cabinet press briefing. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. On Tuesday, the government announced the Relief Emergency Assistance and Community Health Reach Program. It's a comprehensive response to the devastation in some areas due to Hurricane Beryl. Let's recap with Prime Minister Andrew Holness how REACH will allow the state to coordinate a targeted and sustainable relief and recovery effort. As we move forward, our focus is on comprehensive relief efforts designed to provide immediate assistance and lay the groundwork for long-term recovery and resilience. Madam Speaker, today I am announcing the Relief Emergency Assistance and Community Health REACH program. The major element of the REACH program will include the distribution of food and essential supplies, utility, water, electricity, and telecommunications restoration, housing and reconstruction support, and economic recovery and restoration of livelihood. In terms of the distribution of food and essential supplies, Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security has been distributing care packages containing tin foods, flour, rice, cooking oil, and other items through their network of social workers. These care packages contain enough food for a family of four for four days. We are coordinating the continued distribution of food, water, medical sundries, and other essentials to citizens in the most affected areas. This includes working with organizations such as Food for the Poor, the Salvation Army, and the Red Cross to ensure that aid reaches those in need promptly. In terms of water, Madam Speaker, approximately 65% of NWC's customers now have water supply, up from 30% immediately after the hurricane. In a number of cases, the restoration of water supply is dependent on the restoration of electricity to power the pumps. In the meantime, the government is working on sourcing generators and trucking water. We have given a directive to develop a plan for us to get backup independent power supply for critical pumping stations across the island. So in the event of a loss of power, at least we would have the endurance of the system. In terms of telecommunications, mobile and internet connectivity have largely been restored to most urban centers. Efforts are ongoing to re-establish full coverage in rural and remote areas. Housing and construction 
and reconstruction, Madam Speaker. We have begun a rapid assessment of the extent of damage to housing infrastructure in the most affected parishes. We are exploring the use of drone technology to further fast track the assessment. Based on this assessment, we will craft and announce a program to provide support to households in repairing damage to their property, roofs, housing, etc. While we undertake the rapid assessment and craft a broader support program, we recognize that there are certain communities where virtually the entire housing stock has been destroyed. I have instructed the Chief of Defense Staff to mobilize the disaster assistance and recovery team, the DART team, and other supporting units, including the engineers, to cover areas such as Rocky Point, Portland Cottage, on the south coast of Jamaica, where the damage is greatest, to assist with the rebuilding and recovery. They will also be deployed in Hanover to assist with the recovery in Hanover, particularly in the town of Negril and other areas coming around to West Milan. The deployment in Southeast Clarendon will also spill over into areas of Manchester and St. Elizabeth. The initiative aims not just to rebuild, but to rebuild stronger and more resilient homes that can withstand future storms. Economic recovery and livelihoods. While our immediate efforts are focused on providing shelter and relief supplies, a sustainable recovery is only possible with the restoration of economic livelihoods. Two of the main industries in the most affected parishes are farming and fishing. We are in the process of crafting support programs for affected farmers, fishers, and small business owners. This includes providing financial aid, technical assistance, and resources to restart their operations. Further details will be announced as early as next week, Monday. Recent rainfall, the government is embarking on a dengue mitigation program to prevent an outbreak. That means getting rid of mosquito breeding sites in and around our homes, workplaces, and communities, and becoming aware of the threat to your health. Dengue fever is a vector-borne disease carried by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It is caused by the flavivirus and occurs in either a mild or severe form in tropical and subtropical areas of the world. Globally, 50 to 100 million cases of dengue are seen yearly. Dengue is transmitted to humans by the bite of the infected female mosquito. Symptoms typically begin 3 to 14 days after someone gets infected with the virus. Symptoms can last from 2 to 7 days. Over 70% of persons who contract the disease usually experience mild symptoms. Persons affected by the mild form of the disease may experience fever of 40 degrees Celsius or higher, headache, muscle pain, and bone and joint pain. Some people may also experience nausea, pain behind the eyes, swollen glands, vomiting, sore throat, rash, and diarrhea. To be on the safe side and put speculations aside, Persons who start experiencing symptoms are advised to visit their health facility or doctor for medical advice and treatment. If indeed you have dengue, do not self-medicate with treatments that can worsen your illness or cause bleeding. So be sure to have a discussion about dengue with your doctor. The drugs you should not take while experiencing dengue have been known to cause and or worsen bleeding and increase the severity of the disease. Besides the mild form of dengue, Persons can also experience a more severe form called dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is a rare complication of the illness that can lead to death. 
Usually the fever that comes with dengue lasts for about five days. And it is usually when the fever is going away that persons tend to worsen. Warning signs include persons not eating, experiencing persistent vomiting, lethargy, restlessness, shortness of breath, pain in the abdomen or tenderness in the abdomen. Persons should also look out for signs of bleeding. Those signs of bleeding can include bleeding from the gums, um, bleeding in the urine, it can be bleeding in the stool. Um, usually though when you start getting bleeding in the stool, in the urine and stuff, you have reached a severe point. It is important to note that a case of severe dengue can occur without symptoms of bleeding. Also, in a case of severe dengue, there may be difficulty in maintaining hemodynamics, in which a person's blood pressure tends to drop suddenly and circulation to vital organs is affected. With dengue, fluid tends to seep from the blood vessels to the outside of the vessels, meaning that there is decreased blood flow to vital organs. And that is why you get the symptoms of lethargy and restlessness and pain in the abdomen. What those signs are, are signs of decreased perfusion to the brain. It means that enough fluid is not going to the brain because persons are dehydrated, okay? The dehydration and the signs of dehydration are very important to treat. Persons are warned to not wait for these signs and instead go to the doctor or hospital early. People with chronic illnesses such as sickle cell are at a greater risk of experiencing severe dengue. These individuals must use precaution when taking their medications. If you have a chronic illness that you may be taking medications for and you think that there may be some interference with dengue, you must speak to your doctor to decide whether or not you should continue to take these medications. In order to effectively combat and limit the spread of dengue and other mosquito-transmitted illnesses, persons must eliminate mosquito breeding sites in their surroundings. Breeding sites include old tires, laundry tanks, dish trainers, covered tanks or cisterns, drums and barrels, discarded buckets and containers. Other sources are pet dishes, construction blocks, bottles, discarded tin cans, tree holes and bamboo, bottle pieces on top of walls, old shoes and flower pots. Mosquitoes can also breed in discarded toys, roof guttering, bromeliad plants, garden containers and tools, brick holes and unmaintained wading or swimming pools. Where water is stored for use, the containers must be properly covered and sealed against mosquito entry. The use of mosquito repellents containing DEET and long-sleeved clothing are also recommended for personal protection. For more information, please contact the Ministry of Health, 10 to 16 Grenada Way, Kingston 5. Call them at 876-633-8172, 876-633-7771. Information is on the web at moh.gov.jm and contact can be made by email pr at moh.gov.jm or on social media. Jamaicans, practice proper disposal of garbage and if items can be reused, recycle them. We all have a part to play in protecting our environment from pollution. We are building Jamaica. With severe damage to homes and livelihood caused by Hurricane Beryl, the possibility exists for some persons to be experiencing health-related issues, such as hypertension. This can also lead to heart failure. So we thought it was fitting to remind you of a few of the signs to look for. failure means that the heart is not working as effectively or efficiently as it should and so it does not efficiently keep the circulation of blood and fluids around the body as it should and therefore you end up with a 
constellation of signs and symptoms. Patients with heart failure may get swelling of the body, they get short of breath. Heart failure is not a diagnosis in and of itself. It indicates that there's some underlying factor that has led to this. The heart is a very common organ that hypertension targets and hypertension can lead to heart failure. Diabetes, because it works to damage the blood vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle, and in that way the heart muscle may not work properly. Uh, people with rheumatic heart disease in whom the valves aren't working properly and you're getting leakage across the valves or the valves are too tight, over time it can affect the heart muscle and can cause the heart to become enlarged and can lead on to heart failure. Well, three important reasons. One is heart failure is common. We have a large and really burgeoning population of people worldwide who are now living with heart failure. And why is that? Population generally is getting older and heart failure in general tends to become more common as you get older. The second reason is heart failure has a high mortality. Um, we now have very good drugs for treating heart failure, but the mortality is still high and if we don't treat heart failure properly, it can certainly shorten your life. And the other reason is it can be preventable. And that's the most important reason. The easiest way is to identify the underlying factors which can lead on to heart failure and treat them properly. So you need to go and get screened, check your blood pressure, get your ECG done, check your blood sugar, check your cholesterol. These are the underlying conditions or these are the underlying risk factors that can lead on to heart failure. So identify the risk factors because you can, in a lot of circumstances, prevent the onset of heart failure. Heart failure is not inevitable if you have one of these conditions, but you have to be aware and you have to be willing to do what it takes to prevent heart failure. Don't become a statistic. Know your numbers and control the keys to a healthier heart. Know the numbers for your blood pressure, cholesterol level, blood glucose level and your weight and body mass index. Find out the risks they represent and what you need to do to stay healthy. Talk to your doctor and start making healthy lifestyle choices to prevent a heart attack or stroke. This is where our journey ends, but only for today. Do join us again tomorrow and we'll bring another informative program. In the meantime, stay connected via our website, gis.gov.jn. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at gis.gov.jn or via X at GIS News. You may also find us on all the major social media platforms and through our mobile app that's Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.